Whoa. Okay, so I'll be talking about an active, an active scholar, uh, tran a transport equation for an active scholar. So that means that we will be transporting just the function. Uh, oh, okay, let's move. Now, the function will be this theta. Uh, this is just, a, just a, to, to, to have some notation, then I will move to some of the history and then we will, uh, I will tell you a little bit about the math. So, okay, this will be, uh, you can think about, uh, about some kind of temperature, which is moving according to this velocity. And now, well, okay, the velocity will be divergent free. And well, uh, I will be particularly interested in this, in this specific um, velocity field, which is given uh, by this combination of risk transforms. And, and the risk transforms I just wrote here. Those are singular integrals, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why this is a little bit uh, interesting for us today. All right, so this is essentially the, the surface quasi traffic equation. Anyways, let's move. So, okay, I committed the, the mistake of changing all the slides today, so I will be discovering the, the new shuffle that I, I decided to do for today. Plus, in, I include some new slides, so anyways. So, okay, um, there are at least two reasons for, for studying this, this equation, one of them, is that, well, it, it is a model, it is a simplification of a model from meteorology where one expects to have frontogenesis, and that means something that, okay, uh, a front of high temperature and low temperature will collide, therefore you will have a big slope, a big gradient, and that, uh, that's, that's bad for the equation somehow. And, well, the second is that it is related to the Euler 3D equation. All right, very well. So. Uh, why it is related to the Euler 3 equation? This was uh, discovered or um, investigated research by Konstantin Maida and Tabak in um, almost 25 years ago. And they proved local existence and they actually provided a kind of a scenario for finite time blow up. So they expected to, to be able to see if the 3D Euler blows up and having a hint on this kind of uh, active scalar equation, which is the SQG. Well, the SQG is simpler. It is the convection of just a, a function. So one expect that to be easier. And actually you can do uh, experiments in computers and then you will get something, uh, I mean, you will get some drawings and then they saw actually for a specific initial value, uh, initial data, they saw that there was a possibility of a finite time uh, blow up scenario. The exist Sorry, the global existence of uh, a weak solutions was proved by Resnick a year after that, and Diego Cordova dismissed, oh, okay, no, dismissed the, uh, this scenario introduced in this paper four years later. All right, so in our case, we'll be adding some sort of dissipation in here, which is going to be a fractional dissipation. Uh, uh, I will tell you later what I mean by that, okay, exactly. I mean like a precise definition of, of this term. But you can think that this is exactly the same equation as I introduced before. And here we have u, this is exactly the same. As I said with the risk transforms uh, thing, kappa will be fixed for us and we will see the evolution of some initial data, which you can think about something smooth in principle. Now, this subcritical case, so that means when alpha, which is somehow the number of derivatives that we will have in this kind of fractional Laplacian, uh, is well understood, and then you will have a global existence. But understanding the regularity exactly for alpha equals one uh, is more challenging. Why? Because you have one derivative here and one derivative here, and they're working against each other. So the dissipation, is trying you know, to, to make things smoother, but then the, um, the, the transport is trying to destroy that. All right, so that was an open problem to understand that. And if the slides, okay. So problems that, questions that we can, we can ask. So existence, okay. I, I already told you that there, are, there is global existence for weak solutions. You can actually prove local existence. Uniqueness. Well, if the initial data is smooth enough, you will have uniqueness. And this is what we want to understand today. Today, if there are 
if there is a possibility for finite time singularities when we have a dissipation that is critical, so alpha equals one. This means that uh, you can actually study this, the same equation in the compressible case and see if there are finite time singularities, and sometimes there are, sometimes there are not. But okay, let's forget about that for the time being. Okay. All right. So the first result, I think, uh, in regarding the theorem that I want to talk about was due to Kisilov, Nassar, and Wahlberg, and they prove that the, this equation uh, as global with postness in the critical case. I, I will focus here on the two-dimensional case, but uh, these results are true in higher dimensions. Later on, Kefarelli and Basser provided a different proof of this theorem, and actually it was much more robust in a sense, and, 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 and it was stronger because they, they assumed less on u, the velocity field. They didn't assume that u was this particular risk transform uh, combination, but they assumed that it was a BMO uh, vector field. And later on, there was a different proof by Konstantin and Bickel, and they used a nonlinear maximum principle, which was a refinement of the Cordova Cordova type inequality. That I will tell you about this later on. Okay, so this is true in high dimensions, and uh, what I want to talk about today is how you can extend that to, to deal with, uh, um, with the same equation in sphere. All right? And what is the same equation in higher dimensions? Meaning, what's the Well, you have to choose some u, which is uh, divergence free, and you can construct that using some different uh, uh, combination of risk transforms, or you can appeal to Kafarelli and Basser's uh, theorem, which is much more general, and then you just have to give a vector field that is divergence free, okay. and then the theorem will work. So, in our case, the equation will have this, this kind of shape. So, we're working on a compact orientable surface with some metric, G, and then we can actually write the equation this way. So, here we have a zero order operator, like the risk transforms that I wrote earlier. Lambda is going to be a fractional Laplacian that I will introduce in a while. And as I told you, we are interested in the, um, in the critical case. OK. So the theorem reads as follows, or a version of it. If we have a C infinity function as an initial datum, then it will remain smooth for all times. OK. So how do we prove that? So first, uh, we prove that if the initial datum is not smooth, but in L2, then any weak solution becomes instantaneously continuous. Can I ask a yeah, sure. Question? What makes it more difficult than this here? Oh, OK. So we wanted to understand that in any manifold. And actually, we were able to prove that just on the two-dimensional sphere. OK. So, okay, so, so what makes it more difficult? Why is it difficult on the manifold? OK, so as uh, I will tell you in the proof, in the proof, uh, so for instance, let's say, uh, let's talk about Kafarelli and Basser's approach, which is based on the Church's method. They use a lot uh, that they can rescale and they can transport, I mean, like they, they can save the equation somehow. So they, can, they have a certain gauge. So they're using that all the time. So they use, I mean, in, in the proof. Yeah. So at the end, basically, you can, uh, prove what you prove is, uh, I mean, you're reducing everything to one fixed scale, and that's going to be one of the difficulties in in the proof of this because you're going to be a, to need to prove everything at every scale separately, and but but the sphere is really flat if you look at that really closely, but then the fractional Laplace in here, uh, here, is non-local and here is non-local. So, okay, you can do that because you can go and, and see the sphere really closely, and that's almost the plane, but then you have some operators which are non-local, and you have to, to deal with that too. That and it's because you want something global, that the physical theory is completely I want, what do you mean by global? Okay. I mean, uh, if you mean global in time, 
that's yeah. yeah, we want something global in time. But ask me anything. I mean, that's okay. I mean, I prefer to talk somehow. <laughs> okay, so we will be given some initial data, which is L2. It is just L2, and then it will, be, it will become continuous. Well, what Kafarli and Basar did, they proved that it is continuous, but they gave a C alpha um, modulus of continuity. And then from that, they can actually show that the, that the, the solution will be actually C infinity. But we can prove a really poor uh, <coughs> modulus of continuity, which is like logarithmic. And that, yeah, that, that's a pain. And then you cannot bootstrap on this uh, regularity. And that's, that's one of the problems that we have to face. Why, so coming back to your question, why uh, is that more difficult? It's more difficult because we have less symmetries on the sphere. And actually, for something that is not the standard sphere, we don't know how to prove it. I mean, although you can say, okay, it should be the same, but we don't know how to prove it. Okay, so I will emphasize on that during the talk. So first, we prove this, and then we couple that with the Constantine and Bicot approach to prove that, well, if we assume a little bit more regularity on the, on the initial data, let's say that we are in H3 or something like that. I mean, I, I'm not trying to... To, to impress you, giving you the, f the very best on this. I, I don't really care. I mean, I just want the gradient to be bounded. Then the solution will become smooth in instantaneously, and we re kind of recover Kafarel and uh, result. All right. So what do we mean by, by fractional Laplacian? So by fractional Laplacian, I can just, okay, okay. I can just tell you that on Rn, on the clean space is this, and the try is this. And I can give you that that can be given as a multiplier, free multiplier, that works really like the usual Laplacian for alpha equals two, and then you will have to take care of which constants I'm putting here, but I, I, don't, I, I don't care for this talk about that. I'm just telling you that there is explicit version of this. But we are talking about the sphere. Okay, so I will tell you what happens on the sphere too. All right, so, an important inequality is this cordial cordial type, type inequality, which simply says that this combination of the fractional Laplacian times a function, uh, if the function is smooth enough, which you can assume, then uh, dominates this other quantity. So, okay, let, let me, in the, in the next slide, I will tell you why this, let, let's say one point why this, this, this can be important, this kind of inequality, if you try to, to, to understand. Uh, at all what happens with your, with your equation. So for instance, the equation uh, follows some trajectories given by you, and okay, the L infinity norm of your, of your function then is preserved. Actually, you can multiply the equation, which I, I didn't wrote here, sorry. So you can multiply the equation by theta to the P minus one, and then integrate by parts, use the divergence free of the vector field, and th then you will prove that the LP norms remain constant. They don't change. Now, if you have a dissipation, then you have to take care of the dissipation. And that's where the cordoba cordoba type inequality enters the game. And then you can prove that actually the LP norms will decrease or will not increase. Okay. And that's the next point. Okay. So, uh, let me just overfly this, which is that the these uh, fractional type um, operators are related to the Dirichlet to Neumann operator, and for this one, we can actually extend the uh, the cordial uh, cordial type inequality. We did that a few years ago, and the proof is very simple. And actually, um, it gave us a way of proving that or understanding how to prove that inequality, the cordial type inequality, for uh, compact manifolds in general. Okay, so for compact manifolds in general, it is going to be true. I will tell you later what the fractional Laplacian means in that case. But the, 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 the core or the heart of the proof is, is in the proof of this, which is the following. So you consider, I mean, I will overfly this, but you consider this, uh, this problem for a function f on the boundary of some domain, which is fixed. And you also consider a solution to this other Dirichlet problem. 
And then, well, you notice that this W, this combination, this funny combination, is zero on the border because, because V is, the boundary is F to the 2M, but U, the boundary is F. So this is F to the 2M, so it, it's zero in the boundary. Then a uh, straightforward calculation shows this. And then you realize that this uh, uh, right-hand side is positive. As a consequence, you are subharmonic and the normal derivative at the boundary is positive. And then if you read back what that means, that means the chord chord of a type inequality is true. I mean, very simple proof. But it gives you just positivity of some combination. We will need more for the constant um, uh, improvement of this inequality. Okay, so, so this proof is not going to give you much more. But that kind of thing with a, uh, is, is, is also necessary in the, in the arguments that follow. All right. So let me recall you, briefly recall you, what the, the, uh, the, the fractional Laplace Beltrami operator means. So in coordinates, you can recognize this from your differential geometry courses. In coordinates, this is the fractional Laplace Beltrami, uh, sorry, the Laplace Beltrami operator. And well, the Laplace Beltrami operator has some uh, basis of eigenfunctions which satisfy this for some numbers here. These numbers are positive, and I just like this normalization. Why? Because this two is like doing two derivatives. Okay, so that means that in the Fourier side, applying lambda to an eigenfunction is like multiplying by lambda squared, somehow. So if instead of that you multiply by lambda to the alpha, that is what I will mean by a fractional Laplace, which is this in here. So now we are going to be interested in alpha equals one, which is exactly this. Sorry, this alpha should be a one. Okay, this is the one that appears in the equation. Uh, okay, I don't see, okay, now I see. Okay. So, as I told you, the previous proof is not enough for, to make the constant in Bicol, um improvement possible. So we had to work out this, this uh, integral representation for the Laplace Beltrami operator. So, well, if you compare that, the previous, uh, okay, this is not working, so I will, I will come here. So if you compare this to the previous, um, to the previous expression for the tori, let's say, because we are working on a compact uh, manifold, so this is going to be the tori, then this is one, and this is the absolute value of x minus y, which is the distance. Now, how should we read that? So this is a kernel that we can control, this chi is a cutoff, around the diagonal. So this is, this is singular at the diagonal. Okay, nice. This kn, we know for each n which function we should put there. I mean, that, that's, that's given because there are some ODEs and we use, I mean, to prove that, we used a Hadamard parametrix. So, and that's a little bit involved. So I will not tell you anything about the proof of this. This is a little bit like, like a black box. I, I can tell you if you want to, but anyways. So essentially, for the try, this is one, and the error is zero. But in this integral representation, the kernel, we know very basic things about that. <coughs> but the error, and this is important, is, uh, is smoothing. So this, this is better than, let's say, L infinity bound. L infinity won't be enough for our purposes. So, well, so we have, I mean, the, 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 the nice thing that I, want, I just want you to have in, in mind is that we have something very similar to the previous case. I can tell you that there is a proof, a easy proof of the Cordova Cordova type inequality just multiplying by f of x here and then doing some algebra here in the, in the usual case. So in this case, you can do the same, but then you will end up with an error. So this kind of integral representation is not good enough to prove the Cordova Cordova type inequality, which is, I mean, it's, it's something funny. All right, so, uh, okay, this is, this is precisely what I just told you, that that will give you a Cordova Cordova type inequality, but with, a, with some kind of error that you can control. Now, these we can use 
to prove the Konstantin B call improvement that I will tell you later what I mean by that. Not exactly, but quite. And actually, you can use that kind of representation, integral representation, to prove a fractional Sobolev embedding theorem. That means that the Sobolev embedding theorem should be what it should be. But in the literature, we couldn't find, we couldn't locate any place where uh, the, the, the exponent, so the, that the half derivatives is considered. So it's always considering, I mean, in, in the context of manifolds, of course. So in the context of manifolds, you can find for one, two, three, whatever derivatives, but we couldn't find anything uh, uh, dealing with the fractional sub 11 embedding. And we needed a precisely one half. But fortunately, that was a consequence of the previous integral representation. All right. So, all in all, let me, let me recall the, 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 my, my, my first goal. My first goal is to talk a little bit about the proof of how to prove that if you init initially you have an alto function, uh, then any weak solution will become continuous. And I will lie to you a lot. I mean, I, actually, I won't tell you the proof because it is rather long, but I want to convince you that it is feasible and that it is not feasible to explain that to you here. Okay, so before that, let me mention some of the difficulties of proving this com in comparison with, uh, with the work of Kaffarel and Basur. So one of them uh, is that there are no deletions available, which is, uh, answers that. Um, there is no bootstrapping from the modulus of continuity. So the modulus of continuity will be very bad, so there is no way we can just prove this and something even better than that. That's another thing. And the third one, I think there is. Okay, so uh, at some point it seems to break at dimension two. Okay, this I think we can improve. I mean, this probably is that we were uh, sloppy at some point. But I mean, anyways, we were in interested in the two-dimensional case. And at some, okay, at many places we use the two-dimensionality somehow. But I believe this is not a great restriction. So we could, pr I mean, I believe that the theorem should be, pr should be provable for any dimension. But anyways, let me tell you what happens in dimension two. So, okay, let me just a crash course on the Georgius technique. So, well, if you don't know, I, I tell you this was uh, uh, a technique introduced to solve 19 silver problem, uh, but I cannot tell you anything about that, just mention that. I think it's important at least to mention that. So, one ingredient is this uh, energy inequality, which I just wrote in the easiest, in the easiest case. So imagine that you have a function which is positive and subharmonic, I believe, that's it. So that satisfies this kind of inequality. Then you take a phi, which is uh, completely supported on a ball of radius two. Then this inequality holds true. And this follows by some trick in doing integration by parts. Uh, well, if somehow do you dilate, you're changing the, the the metric of the sphere. But like you do that with the torus too, right? I mean, if you're working on the torus and you do a dilation, you get a different. Uh, but the, the torus is like periodic R n, so I, I mean, we tried a few times to dilate, and then we we were losing control, so we said, okay, this, I mean, the the method of the Georgie is robust. Let's try to think about it at its scale separately, and it worked. But we, we couldn't we couldn't do that. Maybe I don't know exactly where dilations are playing a role. I mean, uh, the equation itself is invariant under certain dilations if you want to in a space time or whatever, and and then you can actually say, okay, at the end you play with that, and then you say, okay, but I just I will work on a ball. Of radius one, yeah, and we couldn't do that because right. our ball of radius one will have different curvatures at I different yeah. scales. So you, you can't just prove the George estimate on B one. You have to no, no, no. Prove it on uh, we will prove it at every different scale, with some constants independently of the scale, and yeah. yeah, exactly. So well, okay. All I want you to have in mind is that some kind of this some, this kind of inequality <coughs> is important. And then you can couple this with a Sobolev embedding to prove this kind of 
nonlinear estimate on this kind of energy. So let me let me just spend a minute uh, making a drawing and uh, hopefully, so since you are almost all here, I will draw here. So imagine that, just in case you haven't seen the charges, I mean, if you have seen it, then that will make no difference to you. If you haven't seen it, probably I won't explain too much. So the thing is that UK, so phi K is going to be a function supported in a ball of, uh, so imagine that this is a larger ball of radi the B2 ball. And here we have the B1 plus two to the minus K. And then we have this, this. So UK is going to be <coughs> U, the positive, uh, so it's going to be the upper part of U from, from, from this level. So the level is like one minus two to the minus k somehow. Okay, so you can imagine this is u. So the energy that we are considering is this, this L2 base energy. Okay, probably this should be a two, sorry. So we're just cutting uk, so uk is what remains above this, above this level, and we're cutting it basically here in space. So these balls are shrinking, and the, the limiting ball is going to be like the unit ball in here, and these levels are going up to one. So now the question is that if I do that, if I find something here, imagine that this is one. And I want to prove that there is nothing left. So essentially, I want to prove that U is below one. Sorry, this is, this is one, this is not my answer. Okay, so uh, the method is based on the fact that you can prove this kind of inequality, as I said, using this energy inequality and several of embedding in a clever way. And then you prove <coughs> this, this thing. So let me mention a few things. Here, the constant depends on phi. And actually, as you can guess, here we have a derivative. So here we should have something like a derivative. Here we will have the gradient of phi. And the gradient of phi, because phi is a cutoff function in here, in this ball that is really close to one, but it's like one over minus k thick, the, the gradient is going to be like the inverse of that distance, which is like two to the k. So that accounts for this, two to the k. Now, n is going to be the dimension. Uh, and what happens is that the kth energy, the kth energy is what happens, what is above that level uh, at stage k in that ball that is shrinking to one, is um, controlled by this, this power of this quantity and this constant which is blowing up. The funny thing about this is that if the energy initially is small enough, then you can prove inductively that these energies will converge like a geometric series, uh, like uh, geometrically. Once you prove that, then you see that there is nothing left. I mean, at infinity, E, E of infinity, which is like the energy in the ball of, uh, of radius one is zero. The, 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 the plus one? Uh, when you apply Savalev. Yeah, I mean. That, because I, I think that's the reason we can. That's the reason why it, it falls. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know exactly. Uh, okay. Let me comment on that a little bit later. Okay, okay because, because there, there is something funny about this energy, in, uh, this, this kind of inequality. Okay, let, let, me, let me just drop it for a minute. So, well, okay, what happens is that these guys are going to be to go to zero really fast, and then there is nothing to be left in here. So this, this region that I just uh, picture red here is not there. But that is if the energy is small. So in our case, uh, the energy might be large. So, well, okay, there is different uh, part of the proof, which uh, 
basically is uh, called the isoperimetric, uh, isoperimet the Georges isoperimetric inequality, and then you can get rid also of that hypothesis, which you impose a priori. So that is not a restriction at all at the end. But I won't mention on that. I, I just want to focus that there is some part of the argument that uses this. Okay. So sorry, if, I mean, I'm sure that you know this. But what happens in our case is that the previous idea works. In this case, we need this kind of uh, energy. Here you can see half of a Laplacian. That's why we needed this double embedding for, for a fractional double embedding. And you can actually prove this, this kind of inequality in this case. Well, but this has essentially the same behavior. OK, maybe the constant is, is not a 2, is because there is a 2 over n here, but it has the same behavior. So I mean, I, I'm not telling you what tk is, but you can imagine that those are like cutoffs in time 2, and they, 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 they behave in some manner. So at the end, we can actually prove um, that if we are given an L2, uh, an L2 data, then it's going to be in L infinity. Using this iteration, this, this inductive scheme. OK, that will happen if the energy is small enough a priori. Forget about what happens for large energy. We can get rid of that too using some sort of isoparametric uh, de George inequality. So, uh, OK, this is for a global bound. I mean, this is working on the whole manifold, as you can see. So we will get that if the L2, bound, if the L2 energy in the whole manifold is bounded, then the L infinity is going to be bounded on, uh, sorry. So if, if the energy is bounded, then the L infinity uh, norm is going to be bounded. OK, but uh, we also need to do that locally. Because the next step on the method is to prove that the oscillation of our function decreases when we go from one ball to half the ball. So OK, you can think of, of that as a decreasing of the L infinity norm if you think that the, your function is, is, has average zero, so let's say. So at the end, you can actually use the same method to prove that the oscillation will decay. If you prove that the oscillation decays, then you can prove that the Helder norm uh, is bounded somehow. Okay. Uh, all I'm, I'm telling you is that the same method works to prove that you can decrease the oscillation, the, and the decrease of the oscillation will imply something. Now, if that decrease in the oscillation is not good enough, let's say that you're going not from a ball of radius uh, one to a ball of radius half, uh, then the models of continuity will not be Helder. So in our case, we will go from a ball of radius h, and h will be our scale, to a ball of radius h to the 10. Then there will be some models of continuity, but we cannot assure that it is going to be Helder. And that's, that's the, the cruise of the matter in our case. So OK, so this is where I tell you that I will skip the details, because the local energy inequality, the Kachopol inequality that I, I told you before, fits, I mean, it's basically this slide, which tells you the hypothesis, and next slide, which tells you the inequality itself. So I don't want to lose you in, in the details of this. But let me tell you that it's uh, rather complicated, somehow. So here h accounts for the scale, the ball in the scale. I mean, everything is in the scale. There are some cutoffs. Now, this star uh, accounts for an extension, uh, a harmonic extension of theta k. And theta k are going to be like those, uh, uh, it's going to be like our, the function that we want to study, cut it at this level. OK? I mean, I can see you that you're really lost. I don't want to lose you in here. I mean, this has the same shape as the previous inequality. You mean? Uh, your first theorem was. You mean here? You mean, I don't know. Here? Yeah. 
So yeah, later. So, so that is used to prove what? That is used to prove that the that if the L two norm is bounded, then the L infinity norm is bounded. So okay, let let me just write. There is no. There is no. No no no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? It's after some time you will be, I mean, you will be immediately oh, see LED, okay, okay. but of course you will have to cut off at a higher... Uh, higher I mean, you, you will have a bound from some time onwards. Okay. So, so because it's you have TC. here a T0, exactly. So, so basically, if, if theta 0 is in L2 and small, uh, you will prove the theta at time... Uh, for t maybe larger than t zero uh, is in all infinity and and you can bound. Uh, uh, okay, and is it possible to briefly explain how it connects to that? Or is it how what? How what? How it connects to like I don't see any time evolution in here, so maybe, maybe it's, it's stupid. But uh, I don't. Okay, maybe it's easier uh, to explain. Uh, I mean, you're taking you, so so here you see that. You have the soup on this TK, and this TK are condensate at T0. Well, so I think you see, I mean, it's, I, I guess you're wondering where you see the PE. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's an energy inequality ah. where you're using the parabolicity of the PE. Yeah. Okay. The, the to, prove, to prove that. Right. I mean, you saw the Kachopoli inequality, you were doing things like Lasha. Uh -huh. I mean, you're doing something like the Kachopoli yeah. inequality on the parabolic. Uh, okay, you, so the, the, the reflection from the previous inequality is your fractional. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I lost you. So I'm using the equation and I'm using the actually this this kind of inequality. Uh, okay, okay. okay, okay, sorry, okay. sorry, my, my bad. So now this, ti this time for this inequality, I want it to be local. So that means that I need to do things in a ball. <laughs> Okay, so if I do things in the ball, I can prove some sort of inequality of the same shape, but then I need to control these, this L to N uh, norm. And then you will tell me, okay, you have control on that because you have control on L infinity. But that's false because I want control on that at this scale. And this is important. So, so all the time I, I have to be careful about the scale. I'm working it. And this is very, very technical. I guess, well, at least in my opinion, and it requires that you actually construct some kind of um, uh, barrier functions that you will need to push uh, uh, a little bit the oscillation down. And at the end, it's, 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 it's really complicated somehow. I mean, it's, it's really involved. It's, it's a uh, Machiavellian induction. Can, can you point, are, at any point in here, in this part, is it different from Bassour? Like, is it no, at this part, uh, okay, so, Okay, so in their in their proof, they just use that this is. Um, I mean, because you will be in BMO in their hypothesis, or if you think about SQG, I just proved you that you uh, sorry that theta uh, is in L infinity. Therefore, I mean, you will be in BMO because it is a zero order operator of an L infinity function. So okay, so in their case, they just have a bound on this because it is in BMO in a fixed ball. That's where the difference is, because then they say, okay, every time they, 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 they need to prove something, then they say, okay, I, I proved it in a ball, and at any scale, because I can rescale and do the things. But then we, we will need to take care of this. And actually, okay, so let me go to the next slide. So in the next slide, this h to the n appears here in this h. If you see in the other ones, then you don't see the h, but in here you see it. And then whenever you go and try to apply all this, uh, uh, the Georgie um, uh, strategy, then you will need to keep track of this age somehow. Okay, I, I, okay. I, I mean, I see here, I really see here my enemy. I understand that you don't see it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but if you do like, I mean, that's like a lot of calculations that have to be done. Let's say that the difference is, is not such a difference. It is like that we had to uh, turn and like, be able to put that H there. Once you put this H there, everything becomes, um, I mean, everything will be written in the right scale, then you will be fine. So how do they get rid of it though? I don't, I don't oh, because they can, risk, I mean, at the end, they, they do a reduction, well, at the beginning, and then they can prove everything at scale one. And well, they can do that because they're in the plane, they, they can do these rescalings, but we can't. We can't afford for that. 
Okay, let me continue because I, I'm, I guess I'm running out of time. I just have a yeah, question sure. about that statement. That? I mean, yes. Okay. T0 is arbitrary, you know? I mean, so, sorry? For every T0, you will get an anything bound which goes up, right? Yes. That? T0. T0. Uh, In your result. I think this was just yeah. a sketch or something. This is I mean, then you have to take care of the smallness of L2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have Why L2 small? Because L2 small, okay. Why L2 small? So if I go back, let me go back to the much easier version. So here, the initial guy, the initial term, is an L2 bound somehow. So if I tell you that the energy is small initially, I'm telling you that this is small initially at E0. Yeah. And then using this, I can prove. You don't need this because you have the level that helps. I mean, you don't have to start from zero, but if you start a bit higher. I mean, if, if I start a, a bit higher, then this, this kind of inequality will not assure me that E infinity is zero because I won't be able to prove that it is going to decay. No, yeah. no, no, what she says is that instead of truncating at one, you truncate at a very high Ah, 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 okay, okay, for, sure, sure, sure. I just put one because I wanted two. Ah, okay. It's just a matter of speaking. Of course, I can, I can put, I mean, these will be related to these constants here, but I didn't want it to, to measure with the details, so I just put it at one here. Okay. I mean, otherwise it's like too many constants at the same time. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, so let me go to the, to the more, uh, a little bit more difficult a version which is using this and I think I included here a slide so okay no oh okay sorry I, apparently I didn't include that so well so now you can use the fractional embedding here barrier functions some induction you have to get rid of the small energy using this uh, supermetric inequality on the sphere and in the spheres we know that that happens at small scales uh, and then rotations so at some point we will need the rotations and really, I don't have time to explain that, but maybe later. Okay, so there is there is some that's some some trick here that that uses the rotation. That's you need the sphere and not every exactly, and that's where that's one of the points where everything breaks down for something that is not the sphere. And we really use an approximation of the sphere. We use stereographic <laughs> coordinates. We really we really need to co to control everything somehow. Okay, so okay, so now I can go to the Constantin Bickel part. Of the proof. Now, we should know that the uh, that the uh, that the function has some modulus of continuity, and uh, they proved this kind of inequality. In their case, I won't tell you what the is, but this is like some in some positive integral, and the error term, let's say, that has this this kind of bound in L infinity for the gradient. In their case, they're working on Rn. So how do they prove this? So essentially they use the usual proof of Cordova Cordova type inequality, the one that uses this integral uh, representation multiplied by f of x and then they play a little bit, but instead of throwing the last term which is positive, they uh, make a choice on a right the i and then they play a little bit and then they get this improvement. This, this part, this is the important thing. They get this, li this little piece of information, but to do that, they have to choose some right EI. In our case, we cannot choose a right EI that is too big because we're working in a sphere. So therefore we have this kind of condition in our case. I mean, if, if you read the proof, the proof is essentially the same with some caveats, that is that, okay, here I have a gradient, here I have a function, but okay, what I know, you know, like, I mean, virtually what I can do is like, I can put this inside and then I can play Cordova Cordova type inequality. That's what they do because they can actually commute these, these, these things. But we cannot do that because we are on the sphere. And in the sphere, <laughs> this gradient will not commute with the Laplacian. Uh, but we, we can play with that. We can use stereographic projection. We can use this integral representation. We can, we can massage a little bit all these integrals somehow. So at the end, and, and I, I really want to end telling you the, the, like the last piece, the last part of the story. Let's say that we can prove something like this. In our case, alpha will be one. So this will be a three in here. And, and okay, we will be divided by f. So, uh, okay, 
So let, let, me, let me mention something, something else here. So as I told you, on the sphere, we have the restriction that the sphere doesn't have a large diameter. So this is the condition that will appear. OK, why this condition is not bad for us? It's not bad because if this doesn't happen, if we are not in the case of applying this kind of inequality, that is the next slide, the purpose, what happens is that the gradient of f is going to be bounded by c times a quantity that I know it's bounded already by the previous proof. Okay, and if and that's something that I tell you now, if I can bound this <coughs> uniformly, which is my, my, my goal now, then we are done. Because if I can bound the gradient and if I can bound that uniformly, then it's not going to explode. Okay. So as I told you, the non commutativity of the operators, I mean, even though they are still the differential operators, you need to do this and you need to do this point wisely. That's another difficulty that you have to add to the to, to, to show in this kind of inequalities. But anyways, this can be done. So let me move forward. So I use this notation for basically this is the equation. And let's see what happens. What happens is that after some massage, you can rewrite uh, the, so this is, okay, so this is the evolution of the gradient of theta, which is my, my function squared. And I can see that it's bounded in this way. This is the piece that uh, Constantine and Bickle were able to put here. This is due to them, to this improvement of the quarter quarter type inequality. So what happens now? What happens now is that if the gradient of theta is, is not bounded basically by the L infinity uh, bound of, of theta, then this should be true. Point wisely. Oh, but this error is in L infinity. So now we will evaluate this at the maximum, at, at the point where this gradient attains its maximum, and see what happens. So what happens is that we are led with this <coughs> inequality. So why is that? This is because, well, you can actually assume that the gradient of theta is even larger if you want to. That's, that's some, some gauge that you have. You can impose some, some function depending on dc and blah, 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 and dc also if you want to, and the, the, the constant that is here. And then this is a qubit term that will eat this one. And then you get this. So what happens basically is that if you're not bounded, then the quantity will tend to decrease. OK, so OK, this, this is just heuristics, but this can be, can be done um, in an honest manner. And, and, and to do that, you also have to use the, the Cordova Cordova type inequality, the, the other one, the, the one with the, without this uh, smoothing error. Of course, the smoothing error was needed to put here this error. That's why we, we also had to work here. Um, uh, hard somehow. So well, at the end, this is bounded, and you recover the, the statement that I told you about at the beginning. So if you are in a smooth enough uh, solid, uh, space, your gradient initially will be bounded, and the proof above is telling you that actually, OK, theta will be continuous with some modules of continuity that is very bad, but then you can apply this kind of argument and then you will prove that actually the gradient will not blow up. And then you're done. Okay, and that, that's the end. Thank you.